so. We were kids in the 70s, teenagers in the 80s, and we weren't about to grow up in the 90s. Music, TV, film, and fame. It was the decade when we wanted it all, and we were going to get it. So here it is, 10 years in 10 weeks, 10 shows of the best things in life from the 90s. And we begin in 1990, a very special year for me and a great year for you. My definition, my definition, is this, my definition, my definition, my definition, my definition is this, my definition, my definition is this, my definition. In 1990, I starred in the most talked about TV show of the year. There was a log and a lady, cherry pie, and a damn fine cup of coffee. Oh, and a dancing dwarf that talked backwards. My role called for blue lips and no clothes. But I was wrapped in plastic. Welcome to Twin Peaks. <laughs> Twin Peaks was the best thing I'd ever seen on TV. It was just so incredibly different to anything else that had come before it. It became this cult TV show after one episode, and people were absolutely engrossed by it, are fascinated by it, and if, if you weren't in that gang, you really felt like you ought to be. It was the perversion of suburbia, normality gone sour. I was addicted to it. You, you knew that there was spooky business afoot because the music was just so darn scary. I mean, everybody thought they knew what was going on. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like sex when you're 12, you know? You pretty much have an idea, a vague idea, but then when it comes down to it, you know, it was a lot more involved than you thought it was. I remember thinking, I'd like to do something truly subversive. I felt I wanted to go back to a kind of Hayden Place, 50s style, uh, simple small town values with, you know, a seamy underbelly. The initial response was totally unexpected. It landed like a hydrogen bomb on pop culture in America. It was like being strapped to the tip of a rocket. It, it was such a success from, from right out of the gate. It seemed to really spark conversation. I was never like the biggest David Lynch fan. So when it first came on, I thought, oh, it's going to be a load of hype. But I really liked it. You know, all sort of strange, quite atmospheric. I thought it was brilliant. I can't, I, I can't for the life of me remember what happened. Morning, Pete. Harry. She's dead. <laughs> Wrapped in plastic. Laura, what's her name? Got, Laura. Laura got killed. Is it who killed Laura Palmer? Was that her name? Good Lord, Laura. Laura Palmer. David Lynch asked me how I would feel about being the corpse, put in freezing cold water and wrapped in plastic. I was actually thrilled because I had absolutely no experience whatsoever in film. So to be able to just lay there as a dead person was the best education I could have gotten. I, I felt like a silent sponge just soaking it all up. It's the story of the life of a small town in the Pacific Northwest in the aftermath of the murder of their most popular young woman, the high school homecoming queen and it reveals the network of secret relationships and intrigues going on below the surface of, of this small town. And begin with a murder mystery, everyday TV event, get everybody interested, and then start to play with their minds. Diane, 11.30 a.m., February 24th. Entering the town of Twin Peaks, five miles south of the Canadian border, 12 miles west of the state line. 
never seen so many trees in my life. Special Agent Dale Cooper of uh, the FBI. Lunch was uh, $6.31 at the Lamplighter Inn. That's on Highway 2 near Lewis Fork. He had a fastidiousness about him and um, a, real, a real love and joy that was uh, sort of irrepressible. That was a uh, tuna fish sandwich on whole wheat, slice of cherry pie, and a cup of coffee. Damn good food. I think Cooper was best known way, for his was... particular um, affinity for coffee and cherry pie. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Every day, once a day, give yourself a present. Somehow, ordering a cup of coffee could be turned into such an extraordinary thing, because in, in the end, that's a miracle, too. You know? Could be a new shirt at the men's store, a cat nap in your office chair, or two cups of good, hot, black coffee. Like this. A present. Like Christmas. That great kind of puppy dog enthusiasm he have, had was so original and so, so um, appealing. Oh, man, that is the spot. <laughs> now, here's my idea of a bit of boy crumpet, I must say. I like that. I like that kind of the buttoned up to the collar nerd. Everybody on Twin Peaks was shaggable. Everybody. Even the woman with one eye on the eye patch who was mad for the curtain. I remember Sherilyn Fenn. Who was she in it? Who cares? And I'll have the grapefruit juice. Just as long as those grapefruits are freshly squeezed. Audrey Horn. My name's Audrey Horn. Federal Bureau of Investigation Special Agent Dale Cooper. Audrey Horn, lovely, lovely Audrey Horn. And she was a, a little, you know, sex kitten. I mean, she was really something. Sherilyn Fenn, oh my gosh. She had this great, sultry, young Elizabeth Taylor look. The beauty mark, the pouting lips, the, the ample cleavage, the wasp waist. I mean, she was just luscious. Mm. Just wanted to squeeze her. She, she was spectacular. Well, we wanted Audrey to look like a kind of 50s dream, but with the mind of a, a completely perverse and dark and dangerous woman. I'm not shy. I was looking for a way to really nail Audrey as a character. One of the guys on staff had a girlfriend who could actually do this trick. And she touched her nose with her tongue. Can she flick her tongue like that in some way? Can she roll it round? You mean she tied a, a cherry stalk into a knot? Yes. yes. With her tongue? Oh, my God. That would be popping the sherry, would it not? I think it would. Sign here. I think people tried to do that afterwards, and yeah, we failed miserably. <laughs> I managed it once, I'm proud to say. Um, and any suggestions that I tied it before I put it into my mouth will be strongly refuted. There's a lady with a log. We call it the log lady. The log lady became um, a kind of popular character, possibly because of the ponderosa pine. I have to give credit where credit's due. Log lady. Right. Hi. So suddenly, you're in a world where a woman has a pet log. Don't laugh, because it's not funny. Can I ask her about her log? Many have. Oh my gosh, the log lady! The way she cuddled that piece of bark. Um, reminds me of my mother. Yeah. For your information, I heard you speaking about Laura Palmer. Yes. 
One day, my log will have something to say about this. You could see the log lady going on to be in uh, Dallas or Dynasty or, or going into the, you know, the bold and the beautiful. We used to say that the log and I never flew on the same plane, but in fact, we did. Flight attendants would say, oh, excuse me, are you, are you the, and I'd say, yes, I am, and guess who's up above us? And they'd go, oh my God, can we see the log? It means a lot to people. Cooper's dreams were some of the most interesting and unusual sequences that have really ever been seen on television. Those dreams that always involved um, dead Laura Palmer and, and, and um, Agent Cooper sitting in the middle of it trying to, trying to work out what it all meant. I personally loved that dream space room because there were no rules in that room. The show was so demanding story-wise that occasionally we'd end up with a loose thread in the middle of filming that no one could remember what it had to do with anything. You know, we ran into these weird little cul-de-sacs. Then, you know, we just, David would like bring a midget in and we'd shoot our way out of it. I'm sure a dwarf. Mm. Yeah, there was definitely yes. a dwarf. Midget that tans backwards. Yeah. Hi, sir. Yeah, all that. Uh, and that would get carry on for about half an hour. So by the end of it, you mean, literally you would feel as, as, as if your mind had been melted um, and you were no nearer finding out who had done it. Everyone thought that we knew who had killed Laura, but we didn't know. Even I didn't know until the very end. There were many possibilities of who it could have been. Who did it in the end? Her father. Leland Palmer killed Laura, but the, the manifestation of Leland's dark half was Bob. When I get gray hair, um, I think if I keep it long, and I kind of go, I look like Bob. Ah, I promise I will kill again. I think we were able to succeed and, and break all the rules because we never set out to obey any of them. There was a, a feeling of kind of getting away with something that was pretty delightful. I think there's enough ordinariness on television and enough boring, obvious things that why not, why can't there be that, that kind of weirdness and strangeness and, and tantalizing quality? And so for me, I couldn't get enough of it. Hip-hop had always been serious business. But in 1990, hip-hop went pop. And rap went bubblegum. <laughs>